All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, so now we're going to hear from Jan Vitek. He received uh, his PhD from the University of Geneva, computer science. Uh, for a long time, he worked at the university where he was involved in developing uh, fast R, so a faster implementation of the R language using the Java virtual machine. Now he works here as a professor at Northeastern uh, University in the College of Computer and Information Science. And so he will say about composition and layout with examples in R. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So <clears throat> what I want to do is give you an introduction of how to use uh, ggplot, which is one of the main packages that uh, people use to visualize data with R. And um, what we'll do is we'll try to walk through a few examples. We should have a RMD file. Uh, I'll explain that if you don't know. So let's just raise hands. Who knows about R? Who has used R before? Okay, everybody, right, good. Check in. Who has used R Studio? Everybody ish, yes. And uh, who has used R Markdown? Uh, so a few, a little bit fewer. Okay, fine. Good. So just to calibrate what I need to say and what I can skip. So, um, Right. And so I'll assume that you have some familiarity with the main R data structures. If you don't ask questions, uh, happy to spend time on it, but I don't want to waste yours if you already know. Um, so we'll be using R Markdown. And R Markdown is, a, is an interesting uh, combination of technologies. It's a, uh, a way for users to just drop, write, develop statistical analyses, visualize them, and write the document that explains what they mean together. And the point of R Markdown is, is repeatability. When people talk about reproducible science, well, it is one way to package your analysis together with its result in a way that you can rerun it easily. And you can also share it with someone, and that uh, person can look not only at the pretty graphs, but how they were obtained. And that's often really, really important. So um, behind the scene, R Markdown is, a, is, a, is an interesting combination. So it uses technologies such as LaTeX. It has ways to generate PDF files, HTML. You can write books with it. It's a very versatile tool. And uh, we'll only use it in very simple ways, but I think it's convincing that it's worth to learn more. All right. So um, what I want to do today is go through a quick overview of ggplot, principles, how to use it, and then we will see two, two things in the rest of the, this, the, these sessions. So we will see more about, we'll, you'll hear more about the principles, how to use it well, how to, you know, what is a, a, a good graph versus what is a bad one. And we'll also so talk about the details of the different parts of ggplots, and we will go in more detail. Uh, for today, I will use very simple data sets. So this will be uh, data set, there will be data sets about cars. And the statisticians in the room roll their eyes when I say we'll use that. But this is what the book on ggplot uses. So if you want to, you, you know, to read that book, this will make it a bit easier to tolerate. The rest of the, uh, the, rest of the sessions we'll talk about, we'll use data sets that are more you know, domain specific. Uh, and I guess. One advantage of using the car data set is a lot of people can relate to it. So we'll see if that's true. OK, so, um, so let's get started. Um, so, what I, so, so I have this RMD file. So the RMD files are markdown specific files. They're ASCII. So it's plain text, and it's a combination of commands. 
So for instance, this little bit at the beginning is telling R Markdown what is the title of the file, the author, the date, and also how to output it, output it as an HTML file. Okay. And then there's some more uh, magic. And then finally you have bits of text and then it'll be an interspersing of text and code. At any time I can call knit and knit sort of weaves together the, uh, the statistical analysis, the generated pictures, the text, the, the fonts, the rendering into one uh, document that is a single HTML file. You can see it's going along and producing producing each of these unnamed chunks is a little picture that it's, it's generating a graph and they're being output and then eventually when we got everything, we'll see the complete document being rendered. And that is the document being rendered within our studio and I can also open it in a browser and now I have an HTML page that has today's lecture, right? All right, so what I would suggest is either you start and try to open this RMD file, do you know where to find it? This, uh, so somebody here knows, I don't. Uh, uh, the, the technology uh, escapes me. So it's somewhere in the GitHub for this session? Yeah, yeah, if you have already attended And if you haven't, we'll give you the URL. Um, so hold, hold, wait patiently for a bit. Open up our studio. The other thing we can do, which uh, which is just works just as well, is start with a blank RMD file and start writing it. That works just as well. So let's do that. I'll forget my prepared document and I'll just start it from scratch. I have notes, so. Which I should be able to figure it out. So how do we do that? We say new file, R markdown. Click on this, and it asks you, uh, well, what's the title of the file? I'll say uh, demo session uh, for I don't know ggplot. I'm not too good at at titles. Author. Uh, someone and default output format say HTML we could choose PDF or Word um, and here we have a default document I can delete so there's some 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 standard text but I can delete it if I save it I'll save it as demo now I have uh, created an RMD file and I can call knit and that creates a very empty file. Uh, okay, is that uh, we're we're getting there. Wait a sec. Wait a sec. Uh, yeah, that's a long. Uh, so let me let me see if I can get to it. So the. Um, the file should be in HTTPS colon colon GitHub May Institute uh, bup, 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 bup. So if you go just to May Institute then you can navigate that may be easier so you click to May Institute you say program 6 data viz click and then you go, uh, well, it's, it's intro ggplot rmd. Um, so that gives you the, the file. But I think to download it, you do need something. Let's see. Uh, well, the simplest thing to download it is to just clone or download the whole, the whole repository. You say clone, download zip. 
it will oh yeah but it's a bit big because of the uh, of well it'll download eventually and you'll have the whole program of the school including today's lecture and you can always come back to today's lecture later on okay so uh, shall we shall we get started you know, one more question uh, all right so do you can you help That'll be easiest. Um, so, 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 so. Everybody else? You good? All right. So I'll start from scratch. You don't even need anything for this bit. So the first thing we need to do is install, um, uh, is to, to require whichever libraries we, we will need. So um, I can just, I know which libraries we will need, but since I've done it, so it is h, uh, what is it, h misc, h misc. Then library ggplot, ggplot2, and library, um, what else was it, ggplots. We can put that here. All right. So um, in, uh, in um, markdown, you can just write normal text. This is a markdown file. And you can write R code. So for instance, I can write 2 plus 2. That's a little bit of R code. And um, I can uh, knit this file. Oops, that wasn't 2 plus 2. That, was, that, was, that is 2 plus 2. Mm, now what happened? And I can knit this file. And if you see, this is a markdown file, and the number four is replaced two plus two. So what is happening is I can write little bits of data analysis, and what markdown does is it it is it will evaluate that and return the result. So for instance, if you um, if, you, if you're writing text, you don't need to put 62%. You can write whatever the computation was that arrived at, at that number. And this way, every time you run the document, it will recompute. And if you change your data set, all of the conclusions will be re, uh, recomputed as well. All right. So, um, okay. So what is ggplot? So ggplot is a graphics library that was designed by Hadley Wickham. Hadley Wickham is a uh, scientist at RStudio. And it was designed around 2005 in its first incarnation. And now it's ggplot2, which was updated in 2010. And the key thing about ggplot, the, the, the interesting thing about ggplot is that it views graphics as a set of composable elements. So graphs are built out of layers that you can compose on top of one another. And the ggplot views graphics as consisting of a number of elements. Let me just switch to this file. Um, And I've summarized them here in the slide. So a graphic is a data source. So you, you pick where the data comes from. And a set of aesthetic mappings. They're called AESs. An AES can be the font in which you want to represent, uh, you represent your data. It can be any, any 
uh, graphic the, 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 the width of lines, the colors. Then on top of this, you have a set of layers. Layers are, are the, th the things that you will actually see on top on your graph. So each layer can be a line, a set of points, bars, and so on. And layers are made up of two kinds of objects, things called geometric elements, or geoms, and, st and statistical transformations, or stats. So geoms represent what you see. So for instance, if you want to have a bar, bar plot, you will get a geom that represents bars, that knows how to, to render bars. If you want to have a scatter plot, you will get a geom that just knows about points. Statistical transformations take your data and summarize it. So for instance, if you want to have a mean, if you want to have a count, you use a statistical transformation. And you can compose these to build those layers. Then the next thing that uh, ggplot has <laughs> is scales. So this notion that your data can be rescaled in many ways, and the scales can be uh, can define how the data will look, uh, what will be the axes, uh, and so on. Then there is, for any graph you're, you're, you're going to visualize, there will be a coordinate system. By default, it may be co uh, the, uh, the um, uh, Cartesian coordinates, but you could imagine graphs that make sense as overlaid on a map of the world or many other coordinate systems have been used. Um, then there is a notion of faceting. I'll get to that in a bit, but basically it's a way to break down the data in little chunks and represent all of the chunks together in a set of facets. And lastly, there is a theme, and the theme com uh, is uh, just the color scheme and the general uh, uh, um, general layout of things. And there can be themes that are specific to journals or uh, themes that are specific to uh, software tools. So for instance, you can have a theme that makes your graph look like if it was generated by Excel and so on. So these are the elements, data, your aesthetic mappings, your geoms, your statistical uh, transformations, scales, coordinate system, faceting, themes. And you compose all of this to get a picture out. Most of the time, you don't need to think about all of them. You only need to think about a couple. Everything else will be defaulted correctly. But you know that if you need, you can, you can uh, control every single little bit. OK? So, um, the other bit of, of uh, important, so, so th this, is, this is the general philosophy of ggplot, and it's different from previous drawing system, which were much more sort of trying to force you to uh, make uh, decisions ahead of time, whereas here we can delay decisions, we can compose things, it's, it's, it's much easier to, to, uh, to, to uh, create complex graphs with ggplot. So in order to work with ggplot, we need R and we need data that is in a data frame. So data frames is one of the uh, widely used data structures and think of it as a table, as a Excel spreadsheet, say. It has columns, columns have names. Each column may be of a different kind. Some columns may have numbers, others may have strings, others may have Boolean values, and so on. And, and it has rows. Typically, columns have names, rows have just numbers, but they can also be named. So data frames, so a data frame, for instance, is something that you can build from a CSV file. So if your data comes from Excel, you could just read it in and it will uh, show up as a data frame in R, or you can create one from scratch. Uh, for this lecture, we will build, use a data frame that is built in, that comes bundled with R called MPG, and that is uh, 
a, uh, a data frame that contains some um, fuel economy data on, on cars. So it has consumption you know, for cars driving on, on the road or in the city and all sorts of other, other, other uh, variables. So um, let's get started. So our MPG, oops. So our MPG data set should be loaded. So if I type question mark MPG in R, it will open this window on the side, which contains uh, a description of the data set. Um, if I type um, MPG without the question mark, it will print out the whole data set. And that's 200. So that's 234 rows. And you can see that there are you know, manufacturers, models, display, year, cylinders, DRV, whether it's a forward or four-wheel drive. And these are the interesting uh, bits of information. It's the mile per gallon usage in city versus highway. So typically, uh, the, the, you get fewer miles in the city than the highway makes sense. Okay. So that's our data set, and we will play around with this. There's 234 rows, 11 columns. Yeah, not too big. OK. So, um, so let's see, what can we do with that data set? Um, we can, um, another thing we can do in R is to look at its structure with the str function. So str prints, uh, is, it gives you a slightly different view of the data set. It's, uh, it gives you the, uh, the fields, the, the basic type of the field. So num here means that it's a floating point value. Int means that it's an integer. chr means it's a string. And it also prints the 10 first values, or, or no, actually less than that, a few, value, a few of the first value of each data, uh, each, each variable. So you can see you know, manufacturers, uh, models, and so on. All right. So, um, so, 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 we want to, to, to look at this graphically, um, and uh, the simplest thing we can do with ggplot is um, to tell ggplot that, let me just switch to here. So, um, so in a markdown file, I can write code like this. I can say, here this block of code will be in the R programming language. I could put another language there. A markdown supports, I think, Python at least. And I can say, well, uh, call ggplot and specify that the data is, uh, is uh, this mpg file. So this is the simplest ggplot command you can think of. I told you that ggplot uh, wants at least a data source. So here we're saying, hey, ggplot, create a graph with the data being mpg. And if we say that, there's this little uh, green or little uh, play button here. So we can run it. Uh, oh, ggplot2 dot function not found. Did I not load this? Hmm. What was that about? Uh, run all. Oh, ggplot, sorry. Duh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and we get, what do we get? Well, we get exactly what we should get. We get a big blank space. Because what we've done is we've told ggplot, here's the data you want to plot, but we didn't tell it what to plot. We just said, hey, this is our data. So now we need to specify on top. So this is our canvas, if you will. And on top of that, we are going to paint ourselves 
some visualization of the data, we have to pick what we want to visualize. So um, what could we visualize? Um, so, 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 so. One thing we could say is we could say we want to have an aesthetic mapping. So mapping is a yes. And we're going to say, well, let's make the x axis be the class. So the class of the vehicle, you know, is it a SUV? Is it too compact? Something like that. So we can run this again. And now we have gone a little bit further. So it's still there here. But here you can, believe me, if you can't read it, this is says two-seater, compact, mid-size, minivan, da, 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 SUV. And there's a, a, a class. And it says class. So we've made a little bit of progress. Now we need to pick, pick what else do we want to, to display about the data. We have told, uh, uh, um, we have told uh, ggplot that we want the class. Um, what else do we want to display about the data? So uh, one thing we could just tell it is we want to add bar plots. Bar plots are, are fun, so let's do a bar plot. Geom bar. All right. So now we've made some progress. So the, let me just open this plot uh, in a, let's see. Let me open this plot in a way that is easier to read. Uh, check, check, check. This looks better. So, well, not so much better. The uh, projector isn't very good. So we have our, our uh, bar plot, and what can we see? So here, the x-axis is the count, 0, 23, uh, 50, or 60, all the way to the top. And it's essentially telling us how many vehicles are in each category. So we did that in a very sort of... Um, compact way, we just said this, right? We said, hey, ggplot, take the data, make your x-axis the class, and print me uh, 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 bars, bar, uh, bar plots. By default, if you say nothing else, what ggplot will do is it will count how many occurrences of the class are in your data set and give you that as uh, the plot. You can write the same thing in a little bit more compact manner. We don't say, have to say data each time, and we don't have to say mapping. That still works. So if I do this, it still does the same thing. Actually, I can al also omit the x. And all of this is taken by default. So does that, can you do this much in your own uh, environments? Anybody, uh, everybody, yes? Yes, 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 okay. So you can play around also with other, other x-axis if you want. All right, so what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing that this notion of we are defining, we're defining the axes for us are part of the aesthetics. The geom bar is, is what we are going to, uh, to, 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 to draw on the canvas. And we could lay, lay on top of this more things, right? This is just the beginning of a graphic. It's not a very pretty one, nor one that I would particularly, probably not very useful either, but it's a start. Okay, so uh, so what else could we do? So we could uh, say, well, so we have an x-axis. Why? What if we put something on the y-axis? 
what what could we put well um, let's see what was in our data set our data set had highway consumption well let's see can we put this as our y-axis uh, so we are trying to plot class by highway uh, class by highway consumption uh, no that doesn't work why doesn't it work because the default the default behavior of the geom bar is to count things, and it doesn't know what, how to count uh, uh, highways and classes. So, so it's telling us you can't use a y. We'll get back to the, the y-axis in a bit. So let's let's not do this for now. Um, so what else can we do that would be interesting here? Um, tu, 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 tu. Um, well, if we wanted an, a y-axis, what we could do is just say uh, hwy, but change the geom and make it into a point. So geom point is a different kind of geom, which draws points. So now, you see, by changing the geom, we have changed the way we're uh, displaying the data, and now it makes complete sense to have uh, classes and consumption. So what that says is a two-seater, there is some two-seaters that consume maybe, I don't know, is this 23 uh, miles per gallon, 24, 25, 26. Uh, okay, that's a plot. It's probably not a plot you want to use either. It's a really bad plot. Why is it bad plot? Because I told you there were 234 cars. There are not 234 dots here. So a lot of these dots are overlaid on top of one another, and it's probably not a good, good representation because we don't know how many there are here. It does give you at least some information, right? You can see that uh, um, you know, the pickups tend to be less, less, uh, have less consumption than the subcompact and the SUVs. Well, yeah, it's kind of weird, though. Anyway, hmm. the highway consumption of compact cars seems, seems odd, but okay, that's that's what we can see from this one. All right, so um, um, so we can do we can still do more with our simple box plots. Um, so I'll 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 go back to that uh, box. And um, back to that simple example. So I told you that uh, in uh, ggplot you have geometrical objects and you have statistical transformations. So the default here is to count. So if I run this, I get, uh, oops, I should run this properly. Plop. What am I doing? Weird. Oh, geom bar. Sorry. Bar. Okay. So the default behavior is to count, but maybe we want to uh, to have another um, another, uh, another measurement. So what could be a good other measurement? Um, for instance, uh, we could have, let's see, what did I have here? Um, we could have the, the mean consumption on, uh, on the highway. So, so the, the one I was trying to get to earlier, HWI, we could say, well, Rather than, than counting how many cars there are in class, class, why don't you give us the mean uh, highway consumption of these cars? And this is done by um, a statistical transformation that says, uh, that is a summary, and we say the, the function to run in that summary fun is equal, fun twice equal, 
uh, to mean. So what I'm saying is my bars now should be running, should be displaying the mean of this, uh, of the y coordinate. And the y coordinate is this high, I think. Let's run this. So now you can see that the values here are between 1 and 30. And these are the means of the consumption on highway of the different uh, vehicles. So what have we done to get there? We have told the geome that it should change its statistical transformation to pick the summary and that the y-axis should compute the mean. You can change that to be uh, you know, the median if I want. And that will just work as well. And it looks remarkably similar. I could say the max. And now I should get something different. And I could also take the min, right? And I get another difference. Yeah. OK. So. The point here is that we obtain these very different graphs by simple changes of the specification. Specification is really short, and small, small tweaks to it give us completely different visualizations. All right. Um, so. So what I've been showing you here is the uh, mean consumption, the mean consumption on the highway of these cars. And I can switch this here if I change from HWI to CTY to the city consumption. And I can run this again. And this is the, the consumption in the city for these vehicles. But what, wouldn't it be nice if we could have both in the same graph, right? Makes sense. Have both uh, the highway and the city. OK. So we can do that, but, um, but, but, but the data is not quite right. So it's not in the. It's not in the shape that I would uh, need it to be in. And this is a typical thing uh, where we combine, uh, we combine tools such as ggplot with other parts of R. So um, dply uh, dplyr, here I'm just going to use the base functionalities. So we have data that is not quite right, and we would like to change it. How do we do it? So why is it not, not quite right? So if I type mpg here and run this, so it's not quite right because we have one row that has both county and highway consumptions, and for uh, the way uh, ggplot works, it would be more convenient to have the consumption on, on, a, on a row and then either an attribute that says, is this the highway consumption or the con city consumption? So essentially, what would be convenient for ggplot is if we could take this number 29, create a new row, put it here, and then add a tag here that says this one is con city, this one is highway. So take uh, one row, double it, and then uh, move a number from one row to the next, add a, a tag. So that looks like a lot of manipulations, but it's actually five lines of R code. So how do we do this? Uh, so um, 
So, so, so. Let me just get back to the code. So the first thing we need to do so is so any so I, I, actually uh, let me ask you do you have suggestions how we could uh, re reshape the data any any thoughts Yeah, I was thinking of just using simple functions, but you can. No, nope. we need multiplier. It's easier. Yeah, it is easier. So, thoughts. So here, here's one thing we can do. We can first select out the data we want from the whole data set. That's that's easy enough. So you can say, hey R, take your MPG data set and uh, subset it so you keep only the two column class and an HWI. If I do that, you see I get a data set that has only two columns. And I can store that in a new 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 variable and voila. So I have this. Um, then um, what can I do else? Um, I can um, I can select this in the same way the 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 um, the count uh, the the CTY. So I say C class um, CTY. So now I have two data sets and they're extracts from my original, and uh, they have all the almost all the information I want. Uh, I just need to somehow combine them. So the first bit we can do is for each of these we can add add a uh, an extra column that says wh what's what information they have so we say cbr c bind of this um, um, so so this is a little bit of magic that says add a new column to this data set and store HWI in it. So if I do this and I print this, I will get three columns now, the class, the value, and this string, which is the same for everybody. I can do that for the country, the city, the city and the city in the similar way, cbind uh, CTY. Come on. Uh, good. And then, um, then what do I want to do? I can change the names of the columns because uh, uh, R would like them to to match. So I will say um, names of names of H W I Y R um, C of class, the value, and then the uh, type, say. And I'll do the same for the other data, uh, data frame, Chuck, and uh, call it CT1, Chuck, 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 Chuck. So now what's, what do I have? If I print HWI, I have three columns. They have the same name as in CTY. So now I can collapse those two data frames uh, with rbind. That's the operation that will put them together. CTY and voila. And now if I print DS, I should have, okay, so I have all of my data. So what did I do? I took my original data extracted the columns I wanted in two different data frames, renamed things, pasted them together, and now I have data in the format I wanted to have. And, 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 and. So uh, the next step is we'll try to, to, to plot this. So we'll say ggplot of 
ds. We'll say uh, the aesthetic is the class, the value, which we were had before. And then we're going to say the, the ge geom is a bar with uh, a sum a stat of a stat that is the that is called summary and the summary is going to compute the mean point y plus mean am i good well let's see how that goes that doesn't look right i wanted to display both of them uh, so yes so i need to tell tell uh, ggplot to use colors so i say fill and use colors for this type field that we added and now it should work okay so what did we do we told this ggplot take the new data set use the class and the value of the the consumption value as your x and y so x is class y is uh, consumption and then fill is uh, we told it to use type and type is either highway or city and by default what it and then to use the mean to compute the mean of each of these so the light i don't know bluish color is uh is the mean of the city the redder color is the mean of the highway and we, by default, stack them together, okay? So, this is fine. Now we can see the difference between them. We can see visually that, uh, I guess, consumption in the city looks smaller. It's actually very not a very useful graph because it's hard to compare. Because, you know, is this, is this red bar bigger than this one? Uh, I don't know, I'd have to measure. But it's not a really good, good graph. We can we can improve somewhat by telling uh, telling um, ggplot in uh, in the geom bar to uh, give it positional information. So we say position equals dodge, and what this means is um, is don't stack those two two bars put them n next to one uh, another uh, so up okay so this is somewhat better because now you can compare easily the blue and the red and you can compare the red with each other right so this is a slightly better visualization and again the emphasis here is on the fact that it is all very declarative, right? Your geom bar has all of this information and you tell it how to generate the plot uh, and how to render the, uh, the, 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 um, the data. So um, there is quite a few different geoms that you can use. Um, if I... If I, um, if the, uh, the search, um, I can search for them. Let me uh, give you um, help. Let's search. There's a, uh, you can call the search from, from, from R, so I'll do this. What are all the geoms in the package? Uh, okay. ah, if I could type. Uh, ggplot2 gg and if I type this oops I should put an R here and then I should close that um, well, it didn't work it's printed them here uh, let's see can I make this bigger uh, yeah so this is the list of all the geoms that you can have and you know, have box plot, count, density, error bar, jitter. You know, quite a few violin. So there's, and each 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 time you have a documentation that tells you, you know, what to do with them. So quite a rich set of geometrical 
um, uh, objects. And then uh, there's a bunch of statistical transformations as well, and a bunch of position, positions. Um, if I can switch to this. I have already printed them here. So these are all the statistical transformation, ellipse, function, identity, and you should read them in detail. And then you have positions. Um, I'll, I'll show you examples of them. So we saw dodge, which makes sure that things are next to each other. And jitter is an interesting one. Um, let's see if I can go back to our example with, um, we had an example which I didn't like. Let's see if I can fix it. Uh, pop, 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 pop. Maybe here. Come on. So if I say position jitter on this one, Yes. So you, you see what's going on here. So uh, now we see 234 cars. What it did is randomly spaced out on the x-axis the dots. The y values are the same. That didn't change. It's just that the dots that were on top of each other now are slightly you know, randomly moved left or right. And what that allows you to see is, like here, there was this big uh, cluster, which we didn't see if I remove this, right? If I say position equal, equals identity, identity, what we get is this nice chart, but it doesn't tell us that here there's a whole lot of points, right? So that's, that's something we've, we, we lose. So whichever one you prefer, uh, depends on what you're trying to achieve, but uh, you know you can you uh, ggplot can show them to you. Okay, so the next thing uh, I want to cover. So any questions so far? So, so you could, uh, yes, you can, for instance, you can, uh, you can sort of use size to represent how many points would be in the same, same place. That, that would, is that what you were thinking yeah. of? Probably, yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So that would, would I would have to check. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. Okay. So the next one, uh, next thing I wanted to talk about is how to add error bars. So um, we've been showing... Uh, We've been showing the mean of these. Wouldn't it be sometimes it's co it's it's useful to uh, to add error bars? And um, there's several ways you can do it in uh, in ggplot. One is more manual, where you compute the confidence intervals and you tell ggplot what they are. And the other one is is more sort of built in, where you just hand it off to uh, a function on the side. So I'll, I will show you the, how to do it the, the manual way first, and then uh, there, I'll show you that there's a much easier way to do it if you don't want to work so hard. So, 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 what do we want to do? We want to, given our data set, for each class and each uh, type compute 
the mean and the confidence interval, right? Three numbers. We want to display the mean as a bar and the confidence interval as these little whiskers, you know, little lines and around it. Okay. So um, R gives you all the tools to do that. So there's a function, for instance, uh, in this case, I'm using mean CL boot to compute the, uh, the, the, uh, those values. So I can say, um, if I take, so far I could just take all of my data set, I say ds val, and this will give me the mean over the whole data set, which is not what I want, but it's a starting point. So if I say mean CL boot of ds dollar val, so we're extracting the column that has the values out of our data set, pass it to D. This, uh, this, uh, this function, and it gives us our mean and confidence interval. Okay? So we want to do this, but we want to do this for every, every piece of our data set, every class and every type. So what does that mean in practice? Well, we need to manually extract a class. So for instance, SUVs, that's a class. And I can extract it by saying ds, uh, ds dollar class equals SUV, comma. So what does that do? It says, take the ds data set. Out of that, take every row that has as class SUV and give me back that row. So SUVs is a smaller data set that has all the columns, but only a subset of the rows. OK? So I do that. Poof. Um, what did I do wrong? Error unexpected. Oh, it is two equals. Sorry. Two equals. Chuck. So I can print SUVs, and it should be, yeah. So you can see that it has rows, and the class are all SUV, and their values, and so on. OK. So that's good. So we can do that. And then let's say we want only the city consumption. So we say SUV, SUVs in city is the, this SUVs data sets where I keep only the rows that have a type equal equal city. City, Chuck. And now I can print that out, SUV CTY. And it is only the, those. And now I can pass that thing to my computation to my function to compute uh, um, the mean and okay so this is what I want 13.5 is the mean of the SUVs confidence interval so this is what I want and I want to do this for every class and both CTY and uh, uh, country and uh, Highway. So I could I could cut and paste this code thirteen times, thirteen more times, or however many classes times uh, two there is, but that's bad because it is likely to you're likely to make a mistake somewhere. And cut and paste is the most horrible way to program or do data analysis. So we want to do something that is a little bit more automated. Um, the, uh, the right way to do this is to use lapply, which is a function that walks over, that can automate the, the steps of repeating that, that boilerplate code. So how do we use lapply? So lapply is a function. So if you've been on the uh, uh, advanced R course, we mentioned it. If not, I'll explain how it works. So um, the idea is 
we have a data set, DS, that have a, has a bunch of classes. So we want to look at DS once for each class and extract the, the information. We want to do the computation we want for each class. So how do we do this? First, we need to know what are the set of classes. So what I can do that, I can say, uh, uh, the way I can do that is I say, CLS is um, DS dollar class. I could do that, but CLS probably has too many entries. Yeah, it has too many entries. So we can say unique, rem remove all the, the, the repetitions. Ah, so this gives us all of the classes that we have in our data set. So now what we want to do is, for each of those class, perform that computation. So we're, what we're going to do is we say lapply class. So that means for each of those classes in that list, do something. And what, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to give it a function that takes, a, uh, that takes as argument C and does something. So for instance, if I just said print C, what would happen is uh, I would print out all the classes. But we want more than that. We want to perform this kind of computation here. So let me take this here, paste it here. So we want to comp say x is the ds uh, where we take the class c. Um, xc is, I'll explain that in a second, let me just type it for it. City and um, all right, so what we're saying is we start with our, our full data set, and for each class, the, uh, each, each class, the value of C will have that, uh, will be uh, uh, that class one. So, so the first time we call this function, we, uh, C will be um, a two seeker, and so on. So we start with, uh, we extract out of DS the class we're interested in, then we extract out of that class the city cars, then we compute the values we want. And we do that for the highway as well. We say x of x, x h is x where x dollar type equals h w i y. And we say x h m is the mean Okay, and, uh, and, 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 so that gives us, uh, gives us, uh, gives us uh, some two, two rows, XH, XCM and XHM, that have the values we want for both city and highway. Now we're going to combine them into a data frame, so we say DF, uh, the new data frame will be the row bind of these two uh, XCM and XHM. And uh, what else? And then we are going to add one more column to that data frame to say what class this came from. And this is C. And then we return this. Well, that's a lot of work. Uh, Will it work? Uh, let's see. Um, what did I do wrong? Oh, I forgot a comma here. So the, what the comma says is, so since data frame have two dimensions, so this means we're selecting rows. If I, put, if I had put this after uh, the comma, it would have been an expression for selecting columns. So, selecting rows, so let's see if that will work. Seems happier. 
and it has returned a value. Actually, it has returned us a list of data frames, and the list of data frames we're going to collapse uh, into a single one with a little bit of magic calling our bind of them all uh, on them. We want to capture this in DS2. DS2 and like that. And that should be good. Let's see if that works. Check, check, check. All right, so we have done quite a lot of machination to finally get uh, the mean, the confidence interval, and the different uh, type of car. Uh, uh, should we, should we, should we add? Well, probably we should add the type here. That looks. Uh, yeah, we should probably add the type. So, otherwise. HC type is city. So this is starting to get a little bit more like feel more like programming. Um, So do you want me to detail this or will you believe? That should be good. All right. So yes. So that now we know we know the mean, we know where that comes from, and we know the class. So that's, that's all we needed for our ggplot to be able to render this. So how do we render it? Well, we go uh, as usual. Um, we say ggplot of plot of. Uh, DS2, the new data set, your a uh, aesthetic is still the class, um, Y, the column Y is the mean, so that's what we want to, 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 say, to fill. We want still the colors to, to represent the type, and then we want uh, geom bar and here, the geom bar should not do the, any counting or, or any summarization. So we're going to say, use the identity stat um, and the position positional will be dodge as before. And, um, and now we're going to add the error bars. So geom error bars, error bars, and we're going to say, the aesthetic of those error bars is huh, y min is equal to y min. I'll explain that in a second. Y max is equal to y max. And, um, and then we'll be good, maybe. Let's see if that is good. So what why so I'm saying so telling ggplot. Plot the class as x, plot the y as, in your, uh, as the height of your bars. So this is y, this column that says y at the top. And then we're going to add error bars, and those error bars will go from y min, that's the name of that column, we could have given it another name, but we said it y min, to y max. So we say the y min is y min, and y max is y max. That's why it looks a little bit redundant. But it is because we could have chosen any name for those columns, and we want still this to work. All right. So let's see what happens if we run this. Uh, nothing good. 
Uh, what's I then? TT, if I knew how to spell. Yes. No. Oh, I still don't know how to spell even after a second try. How many tries does it take for? Oh, yes, we have error bars and they look ugly, right? But we have error bars, success. These are error bars. So they look ugly because by default they're ugly. What we can do to this is to um, tell, um, tell uh, ggplot to put, uh, to move them around where they're too, too far to the left and uh, also they're too, width, too wide. So we can give it width and say like say 0.2 and offset by uh, position, dodge them a little bit by 0.9. So you, how do we know which values to put? You just have to play around with those numbers. There is no science here. Uh, and voila. All right. There's an actually, actually a much easier way to do this, but this was hopefully painfully educative because we could compute them uh, ourselves. And that means if we want to compute something else, you can do exactly the same thing and it will just work. The shorter way is in the notes. So I'll switch now to, um, to, to, to something else. Um, so you can, um, with ggplot, you can control the, the text that you're printing. So here's a uh, plop, 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 plop. Okay, just. So here's, um, oh, we're switching also um, data sets. So here we're going to do, use another car data set, but it's not particularly relevant for this. So empty, uh, so our data set is called empty cars. And what we can do is, is, um, is create a point geom that point who puts the points. I'll, I'll show you the point geom without the uh, by itself. So here's empty cars with a point geom, and that's what what that go shows us is well here the x-axis is the weight uh, in, in tons and uh, no the x-axis is the mile per mileage per gallon and the y-axis is the so that's not very informative. So what we could do if we wanted to know which cars these are, in this data set, each car has a name. So we can say, hey, on top of this geom point, add another geom, that's a text, where you use the row names from your input as the, the labels and ignore the rest. I, I, I mean, for now, we don't. That's not totally needed for this example. So we do this, and what we see is, yes, now we've printed the names of the cars. There's just too many cars, and it's not readable at all. So what can we do to, to fix that? There's We could do something uh, like this, where we, uh, we say, Oh, use that jitter thing that I uh, that we used before. And um, no, let me let me. Uh, I was doing this for a subset of the data set, but let me do, do this for the whole data set. And that is a little bit better because it's trying to move the the, the labels around. But there are just still too many labels uh, to actually do anything useful. So. Uh, Another thing you can try is you can play with the size of the labels. And this is the small, small versions of the labels, which here is completely unreadable. But if we wanted to zoom into it, let me paste this here and zoom into it. Well, if you had, yeah, that's still, it's still not very usable. So, so far, no good. So there's another thing you can try. It's, there's a, a library called ggrepel. And if we 
if we run with that, what we get is, come on, is this. So here you can see that the library is being smart. If it can put the, the label close to the name, it does. If it can't, it will put an arrow to say wh what, what name corresponds to what dot. So now you have a way to plot all the cards in one graph. Now, is this very readable? We can argue, but at least the data is there and you can get to it. All right, so, so that's uh, text. Um, you can also add text of your own on, in the figure. So for instance, uh, here uh, I'm adding, so I have uh, this empty card, and I'm adding an annotation. And I say this annotation should be text, it should have this label, and it should be at this position and have this size. So if we run this, and it should have a color red. So if we run this, we see an annotation showing up. Uh, so we can change the size, five, and change the color, right? Uh, as, as one would expect, it will all. So you can, and again, the way this works in uh, ggplot is that this is another layer you put on top of your, uh, of your, of your uh, visualization. So annotation is another kind of layer, you add it to your existing, existing graph. Um, sometimes it's, it's handy to, uh, to so, so you have these bars, but it, it may be hard to read what the value is because, well, you know, the, the axes are, are not labeled at every point. So sometimes it's good to put text that tells you how high the bar is. And here we can do this by saying, well, take a, a, again our MPG data set, put a bar on it, and then add a text that is, uh, has as value the consumption in the city, and it has color white. So if we run this, we get this very unusable graph so you can't see it very well, but what's happening here is there are like these white blobs. And the problem is that for every car, we're trying to print its value on top of each other. That's not what, what we would like. What we would like is we would like to know how, what is the, the, the height of that bar, really. That's what, what I was trying to get at. So, um, so we can do this. Um, we can do this with a little bit of programming again, and I'll skip that for for time. You can read it in the in the notes. But it again means you have we have to reshape the data a little bit. And then one, once we reshape the data, we do the same thing as before. We say we are going to print that that CTY value. And we're going to round it to two digits because we don't need more. Color white, justification two, that means a little bit of, 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 of an offset. And now this looks much better, right? You have your bar, and also you can tell exactly how much there is in each bar. Um, so, so until now, we've been looking at uh, the basic data, geoms and tra uh, stats transformations. Now we can do more prettying up of the figures. So the one thing that is useful is to be able to add a layer that has titles, captions, X and Y, uh, y margins. So here's an example of uh, a layer. So you have your ggplot, you have a geom point. And then you add this lab labels, 
And it says, well, the title, subtitle, caption, X and Y axis. And when you rerun this, we get uh, this graph. Oh, this is a slightly different graph than before because we're, uh, what are we doing here? Uh, so this pull. What is, I forget what we're doing here. One second. Oh, engine displacement in liters. Okay. So here we're showing the engine displacement in liters, which if, if I knew about cars would make sense to me, and the highway is miles per gallon in Y axis. We're showing the type of the car by its color, and the number of cylinder as the size of the dot. So this is getting to be a lot of information. So let's just go through it a little bit more slowly. So we start with our ggplot. Same thing as before. We take the MPG as our data source. Our x-axis is the displacement. Our y-axis is highway consumption. And then we add a geom point, so we add points to this, but we say on top of the, the, this that the color of the point is the class, and the size of the point is the number of cylinders. So now we can display four variables in one graph. Okay? So this is getting you know, nice... I think ni nicely powerful, right? Though this choice of colors may not be optimal, but what you can, you know, what now you can see, for instance, from the graph is like all of your SUVs are here, whereas uh, your, your mid sizes are, are nicely uh, clustered here, and your subcompacts are over here. And you can also see that SUVs tend to have. A uh, larger number of cylinders, bigger dots, where subcompacts some subcompacts have smaller numbers. So this is this is starting to display things nicely, and we have added we have added uh, captions and and titles. So title at the top, subtitle, x and y axis, another caption here, and guidelines for the colors and sizes. Yeah. Ah, right. So, yes, yes, yes. So the, the, you, you can notice that I'm passing aesthetic mappings here and here. So, what, you know, where should they go? So there is a notion of, of inheritance. What happens is what I pass to ggplot applies to everybody else. So if there's something in the aesthetics that you want to apply to all of your layers, you, you put it in the ggplot. If it has to apply to a single layer, you put it in that particular layer. So for instance, the uh, geom point here, the color and, uh, uh, and size only app apply to the points. They are not meaningful for anybody else. If you had another layer overlaid on top, you wouldn't want that to appear there. So what, so what we can do in this case is we could likely move these aesthetics around the, the one from GT plus to the GM plus. Another thing that, that I didn't mention, which is worth talking about, is um, so if you look at this here, I call ggplot and I store it in P. So what is P? P is my graphic object so far. So if I try to print P here, it prints the empty graph, right? I, I just have told it that my x-axis and y-axis are these, but that's it. Now I can add to P. I can say, now the new P is 
the old p plus g on point. And now if I, if I do this and I print p again, now I get just the g on points without all the labels. Now I can say um, p is that previous p plus the labels. And right now I haven't printed anything. It's only when I, I type p uh, uh, at the top level that I get the printing. So what, what, the point here is what we can do with this is we can build our graphs in incrementally and we can use the same graph and maybe you put different labels on it. So for instance, I could do the following. I could say P plus uh, just this one. Uh, come on, puff. So fewer labels and chuck. Now it will. Um, no, that didn't work. Why did that work? Graph skeleton. That's weird. Oh, because I've already already added them. Now I'm. Uh, I have to undo this. So let me just execute one, two, and then this one. Uh, voila. Fewer, few, few, fewer of those. Um, so good. What else can we say? So axes. Uh, so by default. So here's a here's a, a plot that. Oops. Where is where am I? Uh, here's a plot that is not very pretty. So uh, I'm here. I want to know by each car, each model of a car. What is it? Is its highway consumption in terms of geom bars? And I have all these models and all of their highway consumption. So this is a fine graph, except it's unreadable, right? Uh, so what we do in this case is, uh, if we want to display this, we can rotate the uh, the the, uh, the legend, the uh, the x-axis uh, textual data. And we can do this by saying, hey, um, oops, sorry. So your gem bar, uh, we will add a theme. We haven't talked about themes. So themes are uh, typically ways to pretty up the data. And one of the things that the theme can say is, well, your x-axis, angle it at 90 degrees. And that gives you this, which uh, you know doesn't look good on, on this screen, but prints completely fine. But it's not very pretty because of the, um, of the centering of the text. So what you can do is justify it. And there's different values of justification. If I take h just of 1, it justifies it uh, in this way. And now that looks much more uh, pleasant. So themes um, themes give you uh, ways to change the look and feel of, of, of graphs. So for instance, uh, so this was the default theme. If you do nothing, you get this. But you can say, for instance, hey, I want to use the theme that makes my graph looks like graphs in The Economist. And same for the colors. So what is The Economist looking like? Apparently, this is the color scheme and uh, you know, layout style of The Economist. And if you look at the previous graph, you can notice there's a bunch of differences, right? This one had these white lines, had no line bottom. Uh, this was on top of white. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the guides were on the, on the right. Uh, and now the economist likes it differently. It likes the guys on top. The, uh, a solid line on bottom, no line here, you know, different styles. So that's what the theme can do. And um, there's a, a theme called minimal, which is the one with the, le the least frills, no gray background, very little uh, decoration. 
There's even a theme for those who would really, really want to look like an Excel document. I don't know why anybody would, because they are truly ugly, but uh, this was what it would look like. All right. So the last bit for the last few seconds of this, well, there was two last bits, but I'll, I'll just go very quickly through, through this one. Um, so there are, uh, you can display, uh, you, can, you, can, you can add different uh, models to, uh, you can fit different models. So for instance, this is a, uh, we're fitting a, a linear model on, in, on those dots. And this is done by adding another of those geoms. Here you have the basic points, and then you add a smoothed LM uh, line. And there's a bunch of others like that, and depending on what you want to show again, some of them may make sense. This, this shows groups. So you see there we're fitting for the different colors for the different type of cylinders. And uh, you, you can look at the details in the notes for sure, and so on. And the last bit is the facets. And we'll spend more time in one of the upcoming lectures, so I'll just mention them. So our data set has data for cars with a different number of cylinders, four, five, six, and eight. So what we're saying here is, hey, build a ggplot where your data are points and create a facet grid by cylinders. So you see there's a tilde, a CYL. And what this does is it breaks the data set, extracts for each cylinder a subgraph. So this is the subgraph for, uh, or the facet for four cylinders, five, six, eight. And they all have the same x-axis. It goes from two to seven, two to seven, and the same y-axis. Okay? And if you want, you can also do this for multiple dimensions. So here it's it's showing both the num the four wheel. So this is showing the cylinders in this dimension and four uh, forward rear and four wheel drive. And again all of those things. Alright. So to conclude, uh, so we've gone quickly through uh, ggplot. We've used uh, R markdown for reproducibility. ggplot is a very versatile and a declarative tool. We've seen that sometimes we need to modify the data, and for that we can use R functionality. And uh, in case you're stuck, the best way is to Google. Right? There's a huge amount of information on the internet. Typically, if you formulate your question, you will get some page that is saying how to do this in ggplot. So I personally am not uh, not always uh, sure how to do things, and you know often I just Google it. So in case you're stuck, that's a good way to make progress. And with that, we'll take a break. have a um, uh, lunch break for the next hour and we'll be back here at um, 1.30.